This is Public Resource. The Internet Code Improvement Commission. This is Carl Malamud. We are talking today to Sarah Frug and Sylvia Quache, who are at Cornell's Legal Information Institute. Glad to have you. Thanks for taking the time. For having us. Thanks for having us. You bet. Uh, Cornell LII. You got your start with the Supreme Court, right? Wasn't that the first set of data that was put online by you folks? In the dim reaches of history, the U.S. Constitution and the decisions of the of the U.S. Supreme Court were the were the earliest collections. And not too long after that, the Title 17 of the United States Code. Why did you start with Title 17? It was to support a copyright course that Peter Martin was teaching. Peter Martin was the co-founder and former dean, right? He was the co-founder, former dean of, of Cornell Law School. And he, one of the early initiatives that he spearheaded was moving teaching to make use of the emerging technologies that were becoming available. And so producing distance learning courses for copyright, and after that, social security law. Professor Martin is also a noted advocate of vendor-neutral citation. He wrote an alternative to the Blue Book, a style guide. Amazing guy. Uh, The Supreme Court has built a flashy new website now, which is pretty good. Has your traffic gone down because the Supreme Court is doing such a much better job now? Have you noticed? I think that it's unsurprising that after the Supreme Court began to offer its documents on its own website, and that was that was many years ago before they before they redid it, traffic to our website began to dwindle just because it was more desirable for a lot of people who had interest in the decisions of the U- U.S. Supreme Court on the on the day of decision wanted to see what looked like a more formal PDF presentation of the opinions coming directly from the court. So on a link that was directly from the court before before that, there were not outlets that were that were able to offer the decisions in in a in an easily publicly accessible way. And so at the point where, uh, for instance, Bush v. Gore was handed down, there was a a massive spike in traffic to our um, Supreme Court website. But absolutely, uh, since they have improved their website over over many years and their and their offerings to the public, uh, there is there is less of a need for a primary document provision. And to the extent that we have an offering that is different from the U.S. Supreme Court, it's because we are able to offer a more machine-readable format that is a little bit more uh, friendly to readers who are who are using screen readers instead of a visual interface um, and who want to make use of hyperlinks and so forth to other Um, judgments and legal materials that are easier for us to provide uh, on the day of decision in HTML format. You're best known, I think, these days for the U.S. Code and the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR. Certainly, if you search for a CFR provision, the first thing you're going to see in Google is going to be your site. Same thing with the U.S. Code. The government has changed the way they make that information available. I remember in the early days, a lot of this stuff was marked up with something the government printing office was called in those days. They had a system of locator codes, which was essentially a text formatting language like LaTeX. Now, all this information is available in a pretty good XML format now. Has that made your job easier now that the government publishes data in a more structured way? I think this is a good question for me to hand over to Sylvia because Unique, probably among uh, all of us, she was deeply involved in every single 
stage of the publication of the U.S. Code and, and the CFR. And so she has been there since the days of the locator codes and can compare and contrast with what we now have in XML source. Okay. Sylvia? Yes, it is definitely easier. It's easier in some ways. And the challenges between having um, XML and plain text or locator code text there are different kinds of challenges that you have to deal with. Um, USLM, I think, was the very first XML schema from the government that was not a, a soup of tags. The, this was actually markup that made sense, that had semantic meaning um, that we could make use of. And um, as a result of that, it made our work easier in terms of how to present the information to the user because we have a different focus from people who are consumers of uh, legal document standards. Usually the consumers of those standards are the drafters to make their lives easier and cheaper and the process more efficient. For us, it's more the presentation layer. How do we take that information and make it cheaper and easier for the people who need to use that information, who have to comply with regulations, um, do this in a cheaper, faster, and easier way. So having the structure taken care of lets us add the layer of, say, for instance, links to other portions of um, the regulations that might be relevant. We could pick out named entities. You know, we don't have to worry about the structure breaking on us. It's definitely been a boon to have structured markup. USLM, like US legal markup or US legal? US legislative markup. Could USLM be used for regulations? Yes. When you say markup, is it just bills or is it codified law? Well, it it started out for just the U.S. code of law, but they do have an abstract model on top of the very concrete model that they have for U.S. code that allows you to extend it to other kinds of legal documents. So... Um, for the last three years or so, there has been an experiment to convert the Code of Federal Regulations from the current um, CFR XML to USLM. So it's it's a gradual process, and they started with uh, three or four titles, and they've been extending it to different pieces, not entire titles, but different aspects of different titles. So for instance, the referencing model, how references are marked up in the code, if they are marked up, um, has been migrating towards what USLM has, the USLM schema. The Code of Federal Regulations, for instance, has a definition of how the Code of Federal Regulations should be organized within the Code of Federal Regulations. It's in Title One, Section 21.11. <laughs> <laughs> we might look it up later. <laughs> the USLM is flexible enough that if you do not have an element already defined in the schema that can be used, you can add a role attribute that can give meaning to maybe a more generic tag from um, USLM. So it, it's ongoing. And I th uh, in the beta version, um, there are bills and different kinds of um, other legal, government legal documents getting marked up. Samples of them are becoming available in USLM as well. USLM cooked or is it still a beta thing? When, when will it be done? Do we know? Uh, it looks to be a beta thing. Um, the first version, version one, is pretty cooked mm -hmm. and quite steady for the most part. Um, version two brings it a little bit closer to what a command also, which is the other major um, legal document standard in use, brings it a little bit closer to what it does. They're not, it's not a subset of a command also, but it has equivalent structures so that you could uh, convert from one to the other um, with a transformation. And so it, a command also has a richer set of metadata um, markup available that USLM is beginning to incorporate. So th that's the beta version. A common also is shepherded by the United Nations and is being used for legislative markup in a number of countries, I believe. And it's now a legal standard for um, legal document markup that 
looks like it's getting much more interest um, from <laughs> legislatures around the world, especially given the situation with the pandemic, where they had to very quickly move to digital formats and did not want to replicate their paper in digital formats. Why is the U.S. not using that? Why is it doing USLM instead? Um, I think... Um, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong on this. That's because Akomant also was being baked when USLM was being baked around the same time. And also um, the system that Akomant also was based on was not readily transferable to how U.S. laws were made and how the structures of U.S. laws were made. So it's sort of developed in parallel, I believe. If you're doing codified law, like state regs, state legislative codes, and the U.S. code, do you have a preference for one of those two formats? Which would you rather see? I would say USLM. We're targeting USLM at this time. As I said, you can transfer, you can transform USLM into a command or so and vice versa. So we would prefer to go towards USLM. It's also a simpler um, standard relatively simpler standard. It has just one document model. For instance, USLM has 12. Um, so it's much easier to fit what we have. And generally when we get um, a data dump, we don't try to change the XML format that it comes in. What we do is we look at it in view of USLM or a command or so we look at what the standards are providing us and find the equivalent elements perhaps or the equivalent attributes within the document. And if none exists, then we create them as attributes solely so that we keep, we maintain the document structure. Um, we try very, very hard to maintain it in the structure that we get it and augment it incrementally and not try to wholesale move it into um, a different format. So the point where we do a radical transformation is when we present it to a user. Most of our presentations are in HTML. We used to do other formats in the past, but for the most part, it's HTML. That's where we, we might radically do a transformation. But for the most part, we keep it in the structure that it comes in and then augment. You get your state regulations from fast case via public resource, uh, those come in two formats. One is the so-called fast case format, which is essentially HTML generally wrapped in an XML wrapper. And then there's a second format called the case maker XML format. Which of those are you now ingesting to present the 50 state regulations on your site? Which ones do you work with? Uh, ingesting the case maker right now. It is the closest to USLM. It's just a matter of um, different tag names. Uh, you can very clearly make one-to-one -one, um, transformations from the, what something is named in the CaseMaker XML to what something is named in the USLM. And it also has contains much more information in some of the attribute tags that do not make it into the um the HTML version of the fast case. Then we can generate some of the more custom properties that allow us to do certain things. For instance, regulations are marked up in the case maker uh, XML as code citations. They don't encode all of the information that we need to create um, the links that we want to create. But there is enough surrounding information from the hierarchy of the document and in other places of the documents that allow us to create those kinds of temporal um, URLs that go on the website. So that's one reason why we prefer that. It's just more information coming in that you could use for other purposes. You mean things like if a regulation says as specified in section 2.4.1, you're able to build an HTML link over to that page? We're able to build an HTML link over to that and to other federal regulations um, pub and public law um, and other uh, to U.S. Code CFR. When you get state regs and you see a CFR link, you provide a link to your version of the CFR? Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering... Do we believe that things like USLM are far enough along that states could be using this format for their legislative codes and their state regulations? Yes. Wouldn't that make our life a lot easier if everyone... Oh, yes. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Then you don't have to worry about, okay, what is this called again over here? Um, do they have enough information for us to add this feature or that feature? You know, so one feature that was popular for a while was the What Cites Me. One of the technologies that is backing uh, what we present to the public are gra is a graph database where we extract different properties, different pieces of information from the legal text, put them into a graph database, and we are able to make connections that are not immediately obvious and to provide features. So if you go to, say, um, a section in the CFR, you're interested in what other legal documents cite the section that you're looking at right now. Maybe you want to go visit them. There might not be a direct citation from the section that you're looking at to other pieces of legal text. But if those uh, texts cite the section that you're looking at, we have the ability to present that list to you and you could deepen maybe the research that you're doing on a particular topic. Those are the kinds of things that having standard markup across different um, kinds of corpora can give you. I see, I see. Sarah, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the platform you use. Did you like write a bunch of Java and C code to create LII or are there packages that you build on? Can you tell us a little bit about what your environment looks like? Sure. I think maybe one thing to understand is that we have really from the outset endeavored to make the best possible use of being situated within a research university. And so what we have built has intended to be sufficiently flexible that we can bring in emerging technologies and enrich our understanding of legal texts and their contexts in a way that does not require each person who picks up the legal text to gain a comprehensive understanding of all of the markup standards, all of the metadata concerns, everything, but rather to understand enough about what they're working with that they can add value to a particular legal text and then produce an output that enables us to integrate what they have learned with everything else that we have learned. And so Sylvia mentioned the graph database. That is a technology that is very supportive of granular, granular metadata accumulation. And so when we are generating bottom-up topic models of legal content, we can deposit the output into our, our graph database and we can connect that infer topical information easily to the information that we have extracted about the hierarchical relationships of the documents. And as Sylvia was describing, the relationship of each document to other documents, whether within the same corpus or between corpora. We can also tie them to information about entities that are described in the documents and about which we know more because we can connect to external data stores that are offering APIs that give us uh, metadata about these, um, about these entities. And that opens up applications like our find the science feature where you can take a regulation and explore scientific research that pertains to the subject matter of the regulation. And that was based at, at, a, at a first pass on taking two hops. One hop was to identify the named entities within the regulation. And the second hop was once those were identified in a standardized way, to use repositories of scholarship that made use of the, those vocabularies and ontologies to classify their own research. And so without having to ourselves um, process and learn everything there was to learn about 
the primary research, uh, we were able to make to start to make those connections. Uh, similarly, uh, connections that we have made from regulations to agency guidances regarding those regulations, interpretations, that type of thing. Um, and so you had asked me about platforms and infrastructure. What we have done has in, has been by intention um, uh, modular um, and uh, entails, a, I would say, a lot more unusual um, data repositories than you might think. So we have a graph database that we make use of extensively for metadata. We have a native XML store that we make use of to support experimentation and arbitrary retrieval and reformatting of legal documents that we can con convert into XML. We have a meat and potatoes relational database backend um, and we use Django uh, in our in our more modern pipelines um, for uh, a a web framework. Um, Django, the very nice Python-based framework created by Adrian Halavati and many other folks. What's your graph database? Is that open source, proprietary? Did you write it yourself? No, we didn't write it ourselves. <laughs> um, at the moment, we're using one called GraphDB, uh, and that is a that is, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, a proprietary layer atop a, an open source. Um, backend. Your meat and potatoes relational database? Uh, MySQL. MySQL. Yep. Okay. And your XML store? Exist. Exist. Yeah. We have a technical audience. They're going to want to hear this stuff. For topics, we on, on the general index, which public resources created, we used a package called Yake as a way of extracting the most important keywords in an article. Which tool are you using to do that kind of extraction out of the regulations to figure out what the topics are? We have used a mix of techniques. So some of it is formalizing uh, vocabularies and topical assignment that have been done by experts. And so that is uh, a matter of having transformed uh, plain text data into RDF. There, we have used bottom-up topic modeling um, uh, using um, a, a variety. Well, a variety, yeah. yeah. Mallet is one of the major tools that is that was uh, developed by a, um, a now Cornell professor, uh, David Mimno. Um, and so we have worked with that. We have worked with with Jensen on um, other um, other tools to to do that, and then a little bit of exploratory work using some of the more modern um, language models, and that remains, I would say, highly experimental. And so a piece of the work has been about just mapping back and forth among all of the vocabularies and, and making sure that we are able to provide a coherent interface when it comes to supporting the various use cases, including, including browsing in a way that is uh, I would say manageable. Um, I think it's very easy to come up with a very detailed topic model and um, let it get to the point where it, it becomes quite unwieldy. And so there are many examples out there of interaction designs that support better topical retrieval that we have been attending to um, as we as we have amassed uh, more and more vocabularies um, and have had to map between them. How big is Cornell LII? How many people are you? Approximately 10. <laughs> wow. That's not many. Well, we have a lot of help. <laughs> uh, we work with many, many students every year uh, for original content. We work with dozens of law students every year. And on the engineering side, we have a rotating crew of usually master students who come in and work with us for a semester or occasionally a year and uh, and then uh, pass pass on pass on the work to to the next crew that, that come in and usually there are anywhere between five and 15 students uh, that, that we're working with presenting state regulations is this something where you got to be at a major university or be in silicon valley or is this something that states could actually be doing themselves do, do they have to contract this out or is it something that you could see a government department doing itself? 
not everything you do, obviously, but at least the creation of a basic website out of XML and the public publication of their codes in XML. Is this doable? Well, we're already seeing it from some of the states. There are, there are examples from among the 50 states of very beautiful websites that present the state regulations and that provide opportunities for retrieval in ways that are compatible with the, I would say, the mental model of somebody who is walking up to, to a state regulations corpus and uh, offer search in, in a way that is usable and reliable and, and fast. And so that is extremely encouraging. And I think that the work that public.resource.org and FastCase have done to make the source data available is foundational to making it easier for states to have more options now that there are examples of their own regulations in a standardized format that is far more readily convertible into one of the legislative markup standards that is now available and, as Sylvia described, fully baked. What are examples of some of the states doing a really good job? Do you have a few that you can mention? I think that Massachusetts is a good example, and we have we have gone back to that over, over and over again. Sylvia would probably have revisited it more recently. Um, my, my sense of things was that New York is also, also quite good. And Oregon. Well, that's good to hear. Well, thank you so much. We've been talking with Sarah Frug and Sylvia Quache from the Cornell Legal Information Institute, which was the place that started the free law movement. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Our work at Public Resource is made possible by a generous grant from Arcadia. Arcadia, a charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin.